Line integrals are usually written like this. Integral over C of f of x and y times ds. Now when you look at this, you probably have two questions. First of all, what is C? Secondly, what is ds? You're probably used to seeing integrals that look something like integral from a to b of f of x dx. And you probably know how to solve this kind of integral. But the integral over c of some function times ds, that's probably a little bit foreign. So what we're going to do today is we're going to first figure out what this new kind of integral actually means. And then we'll figure out how to convert it into the kind of integral that we do know how to solve. First, let's think about normal integrals. If I have the graph of a function f, and I integrate it from a to b, then that's really finding the area underneath the function f above the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. So it's the area above some interval underneath our function. A line integral is the same thing, except instead of a curve for your function, your function is a surface. And instead of finding the area above just an interval on the x-axis, you're finding the surface area above some curve on the xy plane. Let's draw it out so it makes more sense. Here's my function f of x and y. What that means is that I can pick any x and y coordinate and then it will give me back a z coordinate. Another word for this kind of function is a scalar field because for every point on the xy plane there's a scalar or number that this function will give me. Now we'll draw a curve on the xy plane. This is my curve c in the integral. And so the line integral means the area above this curve and underneath the function f of x and y. You can think of it like if we built a wall above the curve up until the function, what would be the surface area of that wall? So now that we understand what a line integral is, let's see if we can manipulate the equation to put it into a form that we know how to use. First, let's look at our curve C. C will be defined by a parametric vector equation. If that seems foreign to you, watch the video on parametric curves. We'll call my vector equation R of t. So R of t is a vector with components x of t and y of t. So what that means is that I can pick any value for t and then plug it into my vector equation and I'll get a vector that points me to a certain point on the xy plane, a certain x coordinate and a certain y coordinate. So this curve C that I have is the set of all the points that this vector equation points me to. And we don't want this curve to go on forever, so we'll put some limits on t on our parameter. So we'll say t has to be between a and b. So t equals a will point me to the beginning point of this curve, and then when t equals b, it'll point me to the very ending point of this curve. Now we're going to do something that may sound kind of odd right now, but I promise it'll come in handy later. We're going to find the derivative of our vector function with respect to t, so we'll find r prime of t. So since my function has components x of t and y of t, which are functions of t, then my derivative will just have components dx over dt and dy over dt. Now we'll find the magnitude of this derivative, and we'll do it in the same way we find the magnitude of any vector, so by the Pythagorean theorem. So we'll square each component, add them together, and then take the square root. So that'll be the square root of dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared. Okay, remember that, we'll use it later. So back to our line integral. What we want to do is we want to find the surface area of the wall that we built above our curve C and underneath our function. So what we can do is we can take that little wall and we'll spread it flat. Imagine it was a piece of paper and we spread it out. Think of what that would look like. It would be some flat area and the beginning corner of it would be the point that corresponded to wherever t was a. And then the ending corner would be wherever t was equal to b. Then the height of this surface that we have would be the value of our function above the curve. So that would be f of xy, but the x and y points aren't just any points. They're the points right above the curve. They're the points that my vector function r give me when I plug in values of t. So I can write that as f of r of t. Now I just need to find this area. And you're probably familiar with the process. I'll divide up the area into a bunch of very small rectangles, and I'll add up the areas of those rectangles. 
So if my length is divided into small portions, each called ds, then the height of each of those rectangles is f of r of t. And so the area of each is f of r of t times ds. Then I'll integrate from a to b, and I'll get the area of the whole surface. Okay, we're making really good progress. We started out with the integral over some curve c of f of x, y, ds, and now we have the integral from a to b of f of r of t, ds. Now maybe that doesn't look simpler, but it's actually in a form that's a lot easier for us to use. But we still have one problem, the ds. Everything else so far in our integral is in terms of t. So we want to get rid of ds and put it in terms of t as well. Now remember, ds is a very small part of our curve. Let's zoom up on a part of this curve and see what we can figure out about ds. We'll view it directly from above, so y will be going up and x will be going to the right. And my curve will look something like this. This small portion of the curve is ds, and it's so small that we can think of it as a straight line segment. This line segment has a very small increase in y and a very small increase in x as well. So we can think of it like the hypotenuse of a triangle, where the sides are dy and dx. So from the Pythagorean theorem, ds will be the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. Now let's multiply by dt over dt, which is just one, so we can do that. If I pull the denominator inside of the square root, then I'll get ds equals the square root of dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared times dt. Notice that what we have under the radical is exactly what we found to be the magnitude of r prime of t earlier. See, I told you it would come in handy. So that means ds is equal to the magnitude of r prime of t times dt. Now we can substitute that into our line integral and we'll get the line integral is equal to the integral from a to b of f of r of t times the magnitude of r prime of t times dt. That's a lot to look at, but remember that we have everything in terms of t, so it's actually not that hard to calculate. In the next video, we'll work through an example problem, and hopefully that will make this equation a little more concrete.